Okay, good evening and welcome back everyone to our options education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And today we're here to do another live market analysis session. Now, we always do these at the end of a options education series where we take what we've learned and instead of continuing to learn more uh, new material, what we do is we take some time to reflect on what we've learned and show you how to apply it to the real markets because uh, we've spent a bit of time over the past couple of courses talking about uh, hedging strategies and we want to talk about you know using them in the live markets and showing you some real examples because whenever it takes whenever uh, you know you, you learn about options trading it takes a bit of time to internalize what you've learned and show you how to implement it on your real portfolio so today that's what we're going to do is we're going to take a bit of time take a pause take a look at the broader markets where we currently sit and show you some applications of what we've learned so before we get started what we're going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So for those of you that are brand new to options trading, or if you're still in the learning process, if you do not already have an options play account, you can sign up for free at optionsplay.se. It gives you access to everything from options education to the platform that I'll be showing you here today so that you have access to the tools to help you implement what you've learned uh, during the session here today. So I hope that you sign up at optionsplay.se. So today, what we're going to talk about are a few different things. We're going to talk about technical analysis. We're going to talk about portfolio hedging, two things that really merge together really well to help you understand the timing of when you might need a portfolio hedge and also in helping you evaluate the current market conditions and what you need or when you might need to put on a portfolio hedge. So We'll talk a little bit about what a portfolio hedge is. We're going to review what the portfolio hedge is. We're also going to review what are optimal portfolio hedges so that if you're going to put one on, you understand roughly what type of expiration date or strike, price, strike prices make sense to put on a hedge. Then we'll talk a little bit about the trend and relative strength of a market because that will help you give you a better understanding as to how do you determine whether it's time to put on a hedge for a portfolio or put on a hedge for a position that you might have and walk you through again the watch list that we have created here at options play that help you scan for opportunities here in the markets and then what we'll do is we'll make sure that we keep you updated on the current market in terms of where the broad based nordic market indices are trading and at the very end we'll open this up for q a with as many examples as possible so let's go ahead and get started but the primary question that I want to help investors answer here today is really, are the markets approaching, specifically the Nordic markets, approaching what we consider overbought? And is it at risk of a pullback here? Is it at risk of potentially needing for us to put on a portfolio hedge? That's what I want to try to answer uh, for you here today. So my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And I want to share with you how I use technical analysis to gauge the directional view that I have on an underlying stock, the tools that we have built into Options Play to allow you to leverage the same directional views that I use my charts for, and then show you if you needed to put on a portfolio hedge, how you can go about doing so by analyzing it using a, tr a platform like Options Play. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, before I do, I just want to quick get a poll here for the audience here. If, if everyone could please bring up your chat window, which is at the bottom of your screen. And if you could please just type in one into the chat window if you are brand new to options trading, and two, if you have some experience trading options. I just want to get a sense for the audience here in the room. Okay, I see, I, see a, I would say a fair uh, even split between ones and twos. Probably a few more two, twos than ones, but you know, I would say you know, a, a good mix of a healthy mix of beginners and those of you who have some experience trading. Now, regardless of whether you're experienced in options trading or not, I would imagine that most of you here have some form of investments, whether it's a stock or an ETF or some kind of fund in your portfolio that is largely tied to the broader markets. If you have any of those types of investments in your portfolio, please type three into the chat window. If you own some stocks, if you own some ETFs, if you own some mutual funds or funds that you know mimic the, the, the markets, you know, so so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about where do the markets currently sit. Uh, from a broader market perspective. And if you are in the belief that perhaps there is a potential correction here coming up for the market, how do you go about putting on a hedge? And two things that we learned here 
uh, a couple of weeks ago are portfolio hedges and technical, a little bit more about technical analysis. And we learned during that portfolio hedging uh, webinar that there are effectively a, quite a few different options that you have when you have to put on a portfolio hedge. First, we have what's called a perfect hedge. That's simply when you move your assets into cash, when you think that the markets are gonna correct, and then you reinvest that cash when you feel that the correction is over. That's what we call a perfect hedge. That's the simplest and most cost-effective way to protect your portfolio. You can also utilize futures contracts to hedge your portfolio. This is where you remain invested in those stocks or ETFs. You short a futures contract so that if the stock moves, if the markets move lower, you are effectively offsetting the losses that you have in your portfolio with gains in the futures contract. But the downside to that is that if the markets do continue to move higher, whatever gains that you have in your portfolio will also be offset by that futures contract. So it's a symmetrical hedge, if you will. And not everyone wants to put on a symmetrical hedge, but that is one way that you can protect your portfolio. Another way is re simply reallocating your, your assets into more defensive assets, selling your equities, maybe buying some bonds, selling your stocks, buying some gold, buying assets that are less correlated to the equity markets or assets that are likely to rise while equities fall. That's the third option that you have. And lastly, we have what's called a portfolio hedge. This is really for those of you who want to remain invested in the broader markets, remain invested in the stocks or ETFs that you hold. Maybe you want to keep those dividends, so you want to make sure that you hold those stocks, but you're concerned about a downside correction. This is really where we look to buy a put option against the portfolio that you own. And the benefit of a put option compared to buying a futures contract is that number one, it does cost more money than a futures contract, but it protects you It protects you to the downside, but it doesn't limit as much on the upside. So if the markets continue to move higher, meaning the correction that you expect doesn't materialize, you're not giving away as much upside um, if, the, if the markets continue to move higher versus when you short a futures contract, you are giving away the same amount of upside as you are gaining on the downside. So you know those are the few different ways that you can potentially protect your portfolio against a, uh, a market correction. And we learned that there are generally two uh, acceptable ways to buy protection on your portfolio. The same way um, you know, we think about buying uh, portfolio protection is similar to the way that we think about buying insurance on perhaps our car or our home or maybe even health insurance. You get to choose what type of coverage that you want. You, go, you want a, a catastrophic coverage only in the event of a major disaster are you covered? Or do you want a more comprehensive coverage where you are covered across pretty much all possibilities? And with when you buy a put option on the markets, if, you're, if that's the, 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 the direction that you're heading in, we learned that there's catastrophic insurance and comprehensive insurance. You can buy effectively what is cheap insurance that will only pay out if there is a big move in, or, or a big crash in the markets, if you will, similar to what we saw back in February of 2020. Or you can buy more comprehensive insurance, which obviously is going to be more expensive. But even if the market declines only a little amount, maybe three to 5%, you're still going to get some type of protection, some kind of coverage. So those are the things that we learned here, or you know, the first uh, week of this last course here. And then what we dived into is some of the technical analysis side of things. Now, for those of you that may have missed the portfolio protection webinar. I'll show you how to access that after we finish here today. So if you missed that webinar and you wanna go back and learn more, that's, uh, we'll show you how to access those, those recordings. And then the week after we learned a little bit more about technical analysis. And this is really you know, something that I've been using in my trading for the past 15 years as a market strategist, learning how to read the markets using technical analysis has been a very important part of my um, trading because the one benefit of technical analysis is the fact that the same process that I learned how to read a chart for currencies, I can apply that to fixed income. I can apply that for equities. I can apply that for commodities. I don't have to learn necessarily each individual market in order to gain a directional view because a chart for a, a currency is the same as a chart for a, a, a stock, as a, as a bond, as it is for gold or silver. And that really allows you to take your skill set and apply it to 
all asset classes because you know these days all markets are interconnected if you want to trade gold you should have a good sense for the us dollar if you want to trade currencies you should have a good sense for global currencies or fixed income or equities or commodities these are all interconnected and the more um, you know, you can gain in terms of insights from all of these different markets, in my opinion, the better decisions that you can make in your trading. But the question with technical analysis really comes down to how do you have a subjective view to what the chart that you're currently viewing? And that's where most investors struggle. Because when you're looking at a chart, there are many, many ways to look at this chart and identify a directional view. Some of you might be looking at trend, other, others might be looking at a support or resistance, others might be looking technical indicators or moving averages. There's infinite number of ways to read a chart and 10 people reading the same chart could have 10 different opinions. And that is the challenge when you're looking at technical analysis. So what I've learned over the past 15 years is teaching investors on how to be more consistent in their chart reading. And one of the best ways to, to become more consistent is to have automation built into your charting so that you're not making decisions manually every single time you look at a chart. You use the same indicators day in and day out, you use them in the exact same ways so that this, if you looked at the same chart twice, you would reach the same conclusions. And that's really where we use technical analysis in our tools because we provide two very important um, metrics that are important to gain that directional view. Number one is trend. Number two is relative strength. And instead of teaching you the trend, which, we, which we'd have, um, but instead of necessarily telling you which moving average to use, we actually apply it for you. We take the 20, the 50 day and the 200 day moving average. And from those three moving averages, we gain a one month trend and a six month trend. And we apply the same moving averages every single day and we apply it in the same method every single day. So no matter what stock you pull up on options play, you're gonna have a consistent me uh, method to gain your short-term and long-term directional trend. And then what we have is relative strength because what trend can only tell you is how a stock is performing against itself. So for example, if the market is, if a stock is up 10%, um, then I can tell you the trend of that stock is upwards or bullish. But if let's say the market, uh, while the stock is up 10%, the broader market is up 30%, um, that's also important because what that's telling me is that while this stock is trending higher, it is not, it is falling behind the broader markets. And that's not a good thing. Generally speaking, you want to see stocks, if the market are up 30%, you want to see a stock up, let's say 35%, if you're going to be bullish on that stock, because that means not only is the stock moving higher, it's moving faster than the broader markets. That is really the type of relative strength that you're looking for when you're, when you're looking to decide whether a bullish stock is a stock that you want to buy or a bullish stock that maybe is falling behind. And these are important metrics. So that's why we take both. We take relative strength and we take trend because you want to know not only if, if the market is, if a stock is moving higher or lower, you want to know if it's outperforming or underperforming the broader markets. So relative strength are the two, so tech trend and relative strength are the two measures that we think are very, very important for you to understand about every single stock or, e or index that you're buying or selling to understand whether it's outperforming or underperforming the broader markets. And then what we have built here in Options Play is a watch list that allows you to visually very quickly determine whether a stock is trending lower and underperforming the markets or trending higher and outperforming the markets just by a visual, very visual process without even having to look at a chart. So for example, I can show you that these two stocks have very low scores, meaning that they are underperforming the broad, whoops, meaning that they are underperforming the broader markets. And as you can see, because they're red across the screens, that tells me that not only are they underperforming the broader markets, they are also trending lower. So these are what we call classic bear bearish trades. And then trades down here is scores with whoops, nine and 10. These are stocks that are outperforming the broader market. So if the markets are up 30%, these are the stocks that are up 40 or 50% during that same period. And the fact that they're all green across the board tells me these are bullish stocks, strong bullish stocks. These are strong bearish stocks. These are strong bullish stocks. 
And then there are plenty of things in between, right? Stocks that are turning around, and we want to also show you how we can identify them. So here are two stocks, uh, Nokia and Saab, that have very low scores. Whoops, have very low scores, meaning they are underperforming the broader markets. But as you can see, the one month trend has recently turned green. So these are two stocks. Now, th this is a screenshot taken about two weeks ago. So things have, may have changed from there. But two weeks ago, this was telling me that both no Nokia and Saab were weak stocks, but they were starting to turn around. Or vice versa, Husqvarna and JM were strong stocks. But as you can see, we have red across the board. That's telling me these are strong stocks that are starting to turn back around. So we wanted to create a way that allowed investors to quickly visualize all the stocks in your watch list, all the stocks that you may want to trade and understand what phase of the, of the cycle are they currently in? Are they in a strong uptrend, strong downtrend? Are they starting to turn lower? Are they starting to turn higher? Um, this allows you to quickly utilize the options play tool to visualize all the stocks in your portfolio at once where they currently sit without having to go one by one by one by one to research and look at those charts. So those are the things that we learned here in the tool over the last couple of weeks. And Karen, uh, I think your question is the watch list, can it predict the turnaround? So, you know, the thing about technical analysis is that it's not necessarily there to predict, right? It's there to show you what has actually happened. Now you have to make that judgment call as to making that prediction, but we can show you what has happened. And these, these particular cases, these are stocks that are started to turn higher. These are weak stocks that had started to turn higher. And these are strong stocks that had started to turn lower. Now you have to make a decision as to whether you think that will continue based on other factors. In my opinion, I always like to have somewhat of a fundamental basis as well. So if I'm gonna be long Nokia or long Saab, I should have a fundamental reason as to why I like those stocks. Or if I'm gonna short Husqvarna or if I'm gonna short JM, I should have an understanding as to why I want to be short those from a fundamental perspective. And just to give you a sense for, you know, Nokia, you know, right now telecommunications is a relatively strong sector. So perhaps there's a fundamental reason for why Nokia is, is, is turning around. On the flip side, if I look at JM, JM turning around lower, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because housing is one of the strongest sectors right now. Perhaps this is signaling, telling me that housing is starting to turn around, but I don't really have a strong fundamental thesis for why housing would start weakening right now. So. These are the things that I add on top of that, but this allows you to quickly do that research as to where you want to focus your research on. I don't think you should just use a watch list and blindly say, I'm going to go long Nokia or long Shab or short uh, Husqvarna or short um, uh, JM, but these are four stocks that you might want to do a little bit more research on. Pull up some fundamentals, understand what these stocks do before you go long or short any particular stock. But this narrows down the research for you so that you know where do you want to pay attention. So some, some investors like to just pick bear stocks and, and short them, uh, go long bullish stocks, and that's it. And those are the four that they're going to focus on. Other investors like to trade those turnaround trades, stocks that you think are bottoming out or stocks that you think are topping and falling over. Then you would focus your attention on these four type stocks. So this watch list is really designed to help you identify where do you want to do your research so that you're not research just researching random stocks all day long, hoping to find something. Here, you've already identified a potential turnaround candidate or a potential bullish or bearish candidate, and you're doing a little bit more research to find out more about that. So I hope that that helps give you a better understanding as to how you can utilize the options play tool, which again, is built from the ground up to try to make your investment process as easy as possible. So we have these watch lists that are pre-built for you with all of the, uh, the Swedish, Danish, Finnish, and Norwegian derivatives that you can simply uh, to, to pull up. You can sort by the score so that you can quickly see what, what are the weakest stocks in the Swedish market. So here, uh, uh, SAS, which is not uh, surprising, AstraZeneca, Axe Foods, uh, some of the, weir uh, some of the uh, weakest stocks in the markets. And then if you scroll all the way to the top, you know, also Millicom, uh, 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 Ludman Mining, Kinevik, um, 
Evo Gaming. These are some of the big names that a lot of you like to trade. H&M, Husqvarna, as you can see, has started to turn around quite a bit here. Husqvarna actually, uh, you know, actually turned around quite a bit. So let's just look at Husqvarna here, right? Let's show you what happened. So what we were saying two weeks ago, Husqvarna started to move lower here. As you can see, Husqvarna long-term in a very strong up, upper trend, but in the beginning of November started to trend lower here. This was telling us maybe this is a start of a, of a bearish trend. But as you can see, just, just today, actually, Husqvarna started to break out again, broke out above this um, lower low. So it made lower lows. Um, and then started to break out higher here. So this is perhaps a continuation of Husqvarna's strong move to the upside. So, you know, things change, things change every single day. And it's important for you to have these tools to allow you to quickly identify this. So here I can tell you that Husqvarna just turned positive here today. So from my perspective, there's probably a little bit more upside here, at least to about 99 and potentially up to 102 here to the upside, which were prior resistance levels. So this is how I can utilize these tools to quickly identify potential opportunities. Okay. So I do want to do a quick review here of the, of the broader equity market. So let's do uh, OMX S30 first. I want to show you where we currently sit in the OMX S30 markets. So after the severe sell-off here in February uh, due to the coronavirus, we've had some fairly sizable waves of, of buying and selling. So the initial move to the upside was extremely strong. And then from June to, uh, I would say, mid-October, uh, that trend started to, to soften a little, which is expected as there was still a lot of uncertainty around where the recovery was going to look like, you know, when the vaccines were going to come out. We had a bit of a sell-off here in, in the end of October, which got all the way down to the 200-day moving average. And then on the vaccine news, where there was positive vaccine news, the Swedish markets have really taken off here. It's actually ex exceeded the February highs here, which are just around just just around 1900. That was the high here for February. Now we broke out above that level. It came back to retest this level as support, and so far is holding that support level and starting to move higher here. So the question for most investors right now is that. Are the markets going to continue moving higher, higher, breaking above all-time highs and continuing higher, or is it going to crash and break down below back into the range? Now, from my perspective, you know, the technicals is certainly important, right? The fact that it held that $1,900 level after coming down to it and bouncing off of it, that's the first evidence that there is some support for this to continue moving higher. And then when you look at the fundamentals, it, you know, the economic numbers don't look particularly strong for, for Sweden, to be perfectly honest. There are some, um, some, I would say, green shoots from out of manufacturing in Sweden. Um, employment data looks relatively okay out of Sweden. But the one thing that I think is supporting this broader market is the uh, central bank of Sweden that has continued to increase their asset purchases. So when you have a, a devaluing of your currency, that is naturally going to cause equity markets to rise. So, you know, from those, when you look at it from that perspective, you know, when you ask the question, are Swedish markets at risk of pulling back? I think the risks of that are fairly small given the monetary and fiscal policy of Sweden and how supportive it has been for you know, the broader uh, credit and, and equity markets, if you will. So for those reasons, I personally do not believe that we are in a situation that warrants the need to buy protection. But if we see a break below this 1900 level, if this support level no longer holds, right? Let's say it bounces here and starts to break below that. Now I would say perhaps you have the risk of a pullback here. Um, and I, I would imagine that by that point, things probably would have changed a little bit on the on the fundamental side. Things probably would have changed a little bit on the on the news front, um, whether it's perhaps uh, COVID vaccines are not as effective as we think they are, or maybe the distribution of the vaccines are, 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 are challenged. Um, those types of news events, I think, are the type of catalyst that could drive equity markets lower. But we haven't seen that just yet. But those are the things that I would pay attention to. I would like to see a break below 1900 plus a fundamental reason as to why the recovery is not happening at the same pace that we were originally anticipating. So that's my view here on the Swedish markets. When we look at the Copenhagen 25, 
the Copenhagen 25 index, uh, you know, largely has well exceeded the February highs, which were around 1400 or so uh, back in roughly July. So the Copenhagen, uh, the Danish markets recovered much, much faster than the Swedish markets and have been very strong here all the way through uh, the past month. But once the vaccine news came out, you know, so Copenhagen markets put in a high here around 1600 here back in uh, early October. And since then, even on all of the vaccine news, all of the I would say optimism that the world has had over the past few weeks on Pfizer, uh, Moderna, AstraZeneca's, um, I'm sorry, Johnson and Johnson's and, and AstraZeneca's uh, vaccines. What's interesting here and what's really telling, at least for me, is the fact that the uh, Danish markets have not exceeded that, jet, that October high. And this 1600 level continues to maintain as resistance so far. This is concerning to me, but if you do get a breakout here, that would be a fairly strong breakout here. But the thing we have to remember here on the Danish markets is that we are already well past the February highs, well past the February highs. So from my perspective, this does look a little overbought here um, and is now trading within a very tight range here between just 1550 and 1600 here. So very, very narrow range here. And the question is, is this going to break out to the upside or is it going to fail to the downside? Don't from my perspective, I don't think we have to wait too long to see. Um, you know, by the by, the direction that the world equity markets are heading in, it does seem to favor, if you will, a breakout here, in my opinion, to the upside. Um, but you know, a lot of things can happen between now and the beginning of next year. I think most of the risks that I see in the markets really uh, reflect around the distribution of the vaccine. And perhaps once it's actually millions of people receive the vaccine, if there's any sort of um, news as, as around uh, or more information around the efficacy or maybe the fact that the antibodies are not uh, around for very long and people need to get constantly re-immunized. Uh, those are some of the risks that I see to the particular rally here right now because it, the rally is basically priced on the fact that everyone's going to get a vaccine by the middle of next year and everything's going to return back to normal. And chances are things may not go as smoothly to that. So those are the risks that I see to the broader markets. But right now, Copenhagen markets early in the year, much stronger. Right now, actually a little bit weaker, falling behind the Swedish markets. When we look at the Helsinki markets, um, when we look at the... Uh, Let's see, Helsinki, the Helsinki 25. This is one of the indexes that looks at the moment very similar to uh, the Swedish markets. Not as strong, but as you can see, just shy of making a high above the February 2020 highs here. It's basically flirting around with this level. I wouldn't quite call this a breakout yet. I think it's attempting to make that breakout here, but I wouldn't quite call this broken out just yet. As you can see, it's made a couple attempts above it, but quickly pulled back below it. Right now, we're just hovering above that level right now. And the question is whether this can continue moving higher. Again, I think in the short run, over the next few weeks, as there's a lot of optimism, especially if, let's say, the US approves the same vaccines, I think you're going to see a, a bit of a relief from the rest of the world uh, that will likely rally higher on the, on the back of that news. Because when the S&P 500 rallies significantly here in the US, you generally tend to see global equities around the world, at least for the next couple of trading sessions, follow through here as well. And we could very well see that here in Helsinki. And lastly, when you look at Oslo, um, this is really an interesting one because, you know, the Oslo index has a lot of, um, uh, you know, the Norwegian markets obviously have a lot of exposure to oil and gas. And over the past few weeks, and, and the one thing I want to point out here is prior to the vaccine news, uh, the uh, Finnish markets have, I'm sorry, the Norwegian markets have actually fallen behind significantly. This is partially because of their large exposure to oil and gas, and oil and gas has been one of the worst performing sectors in the broader markets from a global equities perspective. But over the past few weeks, once that Pfizer and Moderna vaccine clinical trials came out, it is the number one performing sector um, in the global markets. And that's why we've seen the Oslo index really start to 
outperform here. So you can trade all of, all of the four indices that I'm referring here, you could trade index options on here and in, in the Nordic markets on the NASDAQ exchange. So this is why I'm, I'm using these four indices for you to look at. And oil and gas largely has been, like I said, the, big, the best performing uh, sector over the past month or so, but it's starting to lose a bit of steam here as crude prices have basically stalled here. So if we look at crude prices, you know, we're still trading around $45. And just to zoom out a little bit, this is a weekly chart here on the left-hand side of crude. As you can see, 45 was a support level back here in December of 2018 after the, the severe sell-off here we had right before Christmas. It was a support level right before the coronavirus. But since that coronavirus, it has acted as resistance. Now, if you look at you know, how, what the pandemic has done for crude, number one, it's it severely de declined the demand for crude, right? Because we're not traveling as much from, from an air, air travel perspective, very, very uh, low in terms of air travel right now, especially on the corporate side, which has been a large driver of the growth we have seen in in, in air travel, uh, people are not driving as much because we're not going to the offices. So uh, a lot less demand for gasoline. So this has caused a severe decline in demand for oil. And uh, you know, during the pandemic, we have seen a lot of countries move towards um, uh, getting off of fossil fuels. We actually just had the Danish uh, markets, which is not a large user, if you will, or producer of oil necessarily, uh, decide to, 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 to um, stop all offshore drilling. Uh, drilling. Um, they're actually trying to move completely off of fossil fuels. If we look at the major Gulf nations that are pr the big producers of oil, uh, they have all diversified their sovereign wealth funds away from oil into technology, into other areas because they see the writing on the wall. They understand that long-term fossil fuels and oil and gas is not a sustainable business. They're diversifying their businesses. And then you see countries around the world like the UK, Canada, even California here in the US that have committed to having 100% electrical vehicles in a very short term, 2035, 2040, uh, you know, within the next decade or two, having all electrical vehicles completely moving off of uh, combustion, uh, uh, internal combustion engines. This is causing not only uh, you know, a, 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 a decline in demand now, but demand going forward is likely never going to return to pre-pandemic levels. And then you have OPEC on the other side, on the supply side, that uh, wants to keep oil in this sweet spot, in this $40, $45 price point because it's profitable for all of the petro nations in order to to extract oil out of the ground like Saudi Arabia, uh, the Gulf nations, Russia, um, Norway, it, they can make they make them they can make a profit when when oil is at 40 45 dollars. But all of the North American shale producers, Canada's producers, they cannot make a profit at these levels. And that's partially why they want to keep uh, oil prices at these levels. So for Norway, you know, I think the uh, when we look at the Oslo um, uh, OMX Oslo uh, index, you know, one of the things that I think is likely going to see a bit of a stalling here is that Oslo index. We've seen a lot of strength here, but long term, as you can see, this is an index that has failed to break out to those February highs. All of the other Nordic markets are at least back above those levels or at those levels. The Oslo market, uh, the Norwegian markets, still below those markets, uh, still below those highs. And I think likely you're going to see some stalling here and potentially a, a either a sideways or perhaps even a move here to the downside. So out of all of these markets, you know, the Swedish markets currently actually looking the strongest. Copenhagen falling a little bit behind. Copenhagen was the strongest markets, falling behind here. Um, Helsinki keeping up, but third strongest in Oslo is the weakest out of the four, but has played a lot of catch up here over the past month. But I'm not sure how much more steam this catch up trade really has. And I think is more likely to see some more, more downside, just given the exposure that Oslo has to oil and gas and the predominant um, as a predominant sector that we see here in the broader markets. So when you're looking at hedging a portfolio here, and I'm just simply using this as an example, I'm not saying that necessarily you should utilize this, uh, this particular trade here, but if you do see the Oslo, I'm sorry, the OMX S30 index, let's say break below these support levels, which let's zoom out a little here. 
So this was the 1900 level here. So if you do start to see, you know, the Swedish markets break below the $1,900 level, and you're concerned that it's going to get back down to maybe the $1,700 level, that's when we can start taking a look at buying some put options here. Um, I would look at buying either perhaps that's January or February puts, and we would always compare buying a uh, you know, a slightly out of the money option versus a slightly in the money option. So maybe a 1930 put versus maybe an 1870 put here, um, comparing these two strategies side by side and using our PNL simulator to say, well, what happens if, uh, you know, the NAS, uh, the OMX S30 pulls back to, let's say 1775, whoops, 1775, and seeing exactly how much you would gain from the uh, catastrophic put versus what we consider the comprehensive put. This is something that we covered during that session and I'll send everyone the recording to that so that you can access that page or access those recordings. I wanna make sure that everyone has access to those recordings so that you can follow these along at your own pace. Um, but, but this is really what we wanted to review is showing you, you know, not only the technical analysis tools, providing you with some market insights as to how I'm currently viewing those markets, but how you can use the options play tool to quickly gauge uh, which strategies you might want to trade. Uh, because it is important, in my opinion, to understand how you can utilize uh, options to protect your portfolio, how you can use the options play tool to gain a directional view on a stock that you are bullish or bearish on to quickly gain just kind of a, a gut check, right? So if let's say you're bullish on H&M, you can pull up H&M here. You can look at the relative strength. So this is telling you this is a relatively strong stock that's outperforming the broader markets. It's also telling you that the trends are bullish and you can see here on H&M, it's been bullish here since November 5th. So, you know, I will say that this is a little bit late because, you know, this has been bullish since 153. It's now trading at 187. It has had already a pretty big move. So it's already quite late in the cycle because that's another thing that you have to consider, right? Just because a trend is bullish, you know, you also have to look at, you know, did it recently start this bullish trend or is it already been in this bullish trend for a long period of time because the longer the stock has already been in that bullish trend, the less attractive it is for you to continue to get into that trade. It's much more attractive to get in here or even here than it is up here at 187. Um, and you can just, you know, any stock that you have a bullish or bearish view on, you can quickly pull up and see how long that stock has been in that bullish trend for. So here's JM, here's another one. This is one that I pulled out last week on our trade talks. Um, you know, this is a stock that has largely had a, a major resistance level, broke out above that resistance level and is now, uh, you know, operating that level as support. So perhaps this is the start of a bullish trend here. As you can see, we're very early in that bullish trend here, right? It pulled back here, the trend turned neutral and just turned bullish here. So this could be the start of a longer term bullish trend. And you really have, you know, everything lined up. You have relative strength, right? So you have a stock that's outperforming the broader markets. You have one month and six month trend that just turned bullish here today or yesterday rather. And, you know, it has a, a, that opportunity here to the upside. You have this um, fairly strong support or resistance level that it has been holding for quite some time. And now you have a potential thesis for a continuation higher. Now, this is just the technical side, right? Then you have to ask yourself, you know, is, does it make sense from a fundamental perspective that JM is rallying here? JM, a residential, uh, you know, home builder, a largely residential home builder. And I think that is a strong thesis. You know, if you look at the home, um, at the economic numbers for, for home sales in Sweden, extremely strong. Um, this is still one of the sectors that is one of the strongest sectors within the recovery as people continue to largely, you know, uh, uh, prioritize working from home, um, you know, uh, you know, the shift in working from home is likely more of a permanent feature here, you know, not just here in the US, but globally. So, you know, fundamentally, it makes sense why this works. And you, then you can explore option strategies that might make sense to allow you to take that bullish view here for JM, whether you want to buy a call option or sell a put option. You know, those are some of the things that we also explored of the different strategies that you can take. But this is really where the tool options play allow you to explore different strategies so that you can select 
you know, selling a put versus buying a call versus buying a call spread and seeing how they all perform in different scenarios. So if the stock goes higher, how much money do you make? If you go lower, how much money do you lose? Um, and really giving you the tools to understand and evaluate each strategy before you go ahead and execute. And when you're ready to execute that, all you have to do is click on the trade button. We even have this short code that you can paste into your Nornet or Avanza account and it will pull up exactly this, this option contract, the January 15th, 275 call option. Um, it will pull that up if you simply search the short code in your Nornet or Avanza account. And this way you can have the exact option strategy that you're viewing an options play to pull up on your platform to execute. Um, so we really built this from the ground up to not only teach you how to utilize options, but provide you with the tools so that you can gain the directional view on your own and then gain the, uh, you know, the trading strategy or the option strategy on your own and being able to analyze that. So that's really what we've, uh, you know, what I hope to cover with you here today to give you a sense for just all around how you can potentially use our tool in conjunction with giving you a, a bit of a, an understanding as to how I'm viewing the, uh, the major Nordic markets in the current moment and whether or not it makes sense, in my opinion, to consider putting on a hedge. In my opinion, I don't think uh, this is now the time to do so. But like I said, if we start to see some turnarounds, if we start to break below some of those major support levels that I'm referring to, then you may want to consider uh, evaluating a hedge for your portfolio. So with that, what I'll do is I'll open this up for Q&A at this point. Uh, I do want to give everyone the opportunity to um, uh, learn uh, to, to take some time and, and, you know, take what you've learned and see if you have any questions regarding it. And while you type in your questions into the Q&A window uh, or the chat window, I just posted a link into the chat window with the, um, uh, the link where all of our educational webinars sit. So if you want to watch any of the previously recorded webinars, you can find it on that page I just sent you where we have the last two courses, the hedging strategy and the technical analysis one are all at the bottom of the page um, so that you can watch that recording. So with that, like I said, thank you so much for taking the time out here this afternoon. What I'll do is I'll open this up for Q&A. If you have any questions, please type it into the chat window and I'll try to answer as many questions as I, ha as I have time for here for today. Um, when you get a signal pointing to a higher or lower price regarding the stock, how long do you wait before you are sure about the signal and act on it? Um, so Corinne, I, I don't know, it depends on what kind of signal you're referring to. Um, you know, so if you don't mind clarifying, when you say signal, what kind of signal are you referring to? Um, Corinne is also asking, are all companies on the watch list from large cap to spotlight Sweden? So um, these are not necessarily all uh, large cap. These are all the symbols that have options listed on them. So largely, you know, there are requirements when they're, when they're listed for options. There has to be minimum number of shares traded in terms of uh, the underlying stock. There needs to be a minimum market cap. Um, and there are certain other um, corporate governance uh, requirements for them to list options on. But every single one of these 64 names are the Swedish names that currently have options listed on them. Same thing for all of the other ones. Um, when you click on them, it'll show you uh, the symbols that you can trade options on. Uh, Sigvard is saying, what about having the historical volatility, including in the key data summary to compare with implied one? So Sigvard, so, you know, the reason that we don't include historical volatility, because historic, comparing historical versus implied volatility is not actually what I think you're looking for, because when you're, when you're asking for that, I think you're trying to gauge whether the implied volatility is relatively cheap or relatively expensive. But comparing what the last 30 days is versus what the implied is looking at, those, are, those two don't really have anything to do with each other. What you really want to see is where is the current implied volatility compared to the hist history of implied volatilities, not historical volatility. But that is one of the things that we are currently working on here for the Nordic markets is getting access to the historical historical implied volatility data so that we can show you where today's implied volatility data is compared to historical implied volatility. 
Historical implied volatility is very different from historical volatility. Those are two different things because historical volatility is calculated from realized volatility versus implied volatility is what the market is expecting the future to look like. So Sigvar, that is something that we're currently working on, but that is not something that we have just yet. It's, it's going to be a 2021 feature. Uh, Bose is saying, hi, Tony, will you add Delta to the strike price for us in Sweden? Yes, that is one of the things that we're currently working on in the US. What we have are the Delta numbers next to the strike price and the premiums. We are in the process of adding Delta to this list as well so that you can see multiple ways of selecting your strike price, either by the strike price itself, the premium or the Delta of that strike price. Uh, Mika is saying, can you name a broker who operates in US stock options market and use options play tool. Um, Mika, so, uh, you know, I, from my perspective, you know, if you're in Sweden, I'm not sure that they accept Swedish customers um, or, or in the Nordics. I'm not sure they accept uh, customers, but, you know, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch is one. Uh, E-Option is another one. First Trade is another one. Um, but that only gives you access to the tool. That doesn't give you access to the education. It doesn't give you access to the, uh, the trade ideas that we send out here in the U.S. So if you're looking for the U.S. version of Options Play, you can sign up for, uh, for it at optionsplay.com. There's a free 30-day trial so that you can test it out. If you trade U.S. stocks, um, you can use Options Play for that. Uh, Karen is saying signal, I mean, break out up or down when it comes to stock price. So Karen, that depends, right? That depends on how aggressive you like to be. So for example, um, from my perspective, I prefer to be more conservative, meaning if you zoom into this, uh, let's look at this particular trade, right? So um, and let's make it, let's zoom in a little. So this is the, so this was the prior high back here in June, right, uh, of, of, of the Oslo 20 index was around just around 800 or so. So you can trade it on the first breakout here, which would be this particular candle. Um, that would be what I would consider a very aggressive entry because many times or, or some of the time when you get a breakout here over the next few days, it simply fails and comes back below it. Right. Um, so my preference is always to wait for a retest of the breakout level here. So as you can see, um, it, after the first few days, uh, it broke out. And then one, two, three days later, it came back to all the way back down to the 800 level and then bounced higher. So for my preference, I would prefer to be more conservative and wait for that bounce because that provides me the confirmation that this 800 level is holding and that I have a higher probability of that continuation lower here. Now, how long does it take for the stock to come back down? Usually it's within a week or two. Sometimes the stock doesn't take off. Sometimes you don't get that, that retest. Sometimes it just goes straight up and you miss it, right? And that's okay. So, you know, that's, that's why some people like to go early, but that has higher risk in my opinion. Other people like to be late. It's a, it's, a, it's a higher probability trade, but sometimes you miss out on some trades. I personally prefer to wait for the pullback, con confirm that that level is held before I look for the continuation higher. And, but that means, again, that sometimes I do miss out on opportunities where the stock just takes off and doesn't pull back and just continues moving higher. So I hope that, an that answered your question. Um, any other questions? Oh, it looks like there's a couple of questions in the Q&A window. Let's see. Um, buy put options are very expensive on the strike prices. Where should you put your strike prices? Also, often the put does not hedge my, uh, my total portfolio, only just a small part. How much of my stock portfolio should I hedge? So uh, you're right. Put options are very expensive. And that's one of the things that I address in my session. Um, so I highly recommend you to watch the, my recording uh, because I address all of your questions. I address, you know, number one, you know, why you put options are so expensive and why and how you can mitigate that predominantly around selling call uh, cover calls uh, right now when you expect that you're going to need to put on a put uh, put on a put on a hedge is to sell cover calls to offset some of the premium of that put option. 
Um, also, you don't want to buy put option early. You actually want to wait for the correction to actually start before you buy that put option. It's actually going to be more expensive, but you're going to need it. So you're not buying protection, hoping that you're going to need it. You're only buying protection when you need it. And then third of all, timing, making sure that you get the timing right are, are three ways that you can reduce the cost of buying protection. As far as how much protection you buy, that is unfortunately a question that only you can answer. It depends on how much protection you're really looking for. Uh, you know, that's completely up to you as to whether you want to protect your entire portfolio. I would say almost no investor tries to protect their entire portfolio. Generally, you're always trying to protect a portion of your portfolio. Um, but, you know, somewhere in the 50% range is usually where most people look as far as buying protection on their portfolio. Um, Roger is saying, is there a correlation between S&P and Nordic markets? I would imagine that the correlation between Nordic and um and U.S. markets are very, very high. Um, I'd have to run the, um, uh, you know, let me see if I can, if I can show you what the correlation of, uh, this doesn't allow me to, um, uh, I don't have the correlation numbers up in my head, but I, I would imagine that if you look at the Stockholm versus the S&P 500, the correlation is definitely above 85, 90%, I would say, in my opinion. Um, they're very, very high. Any other questions? Um, I just posted a link again in the chat window with um, uh, with the links to the recording. So if you want to watch the hedging portfolio uh, recording, which um, I, I highly recommend for the person who asked the question about hedging and how much to hedge, um, and technical analysis, which is very important, I think, for anyone, even if you're a stock trader, even if you're brand new to options trading, you're not ready to trade options just yet, the technical analysis piece is going to be very important to help you gain that directional view. Um, Bose, yes, I have had a chance to take a look at IV rank. That's what I was saying before here. IV rank is a much better way to gauge um, you know, whether implied volatility is relatively cheap or relatively expensive. That is something that we are planning for 2021. Um, we're still working with NASDAQ on getting all of the data for that, but that is one of the things that we certainly want to bring to the Nordic markets. How do you trade a counter trade breakout? Um, oh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by counter trend breakout. If you don't mind helping me define what you mean by a counter trade breakout, I'm happy to help you with that because a breakout is the opposite of a counter trend. A breakout is a continuation in the direction versus counter is a reversal. Um, but I would, I, I guess, you know, you know, as far as a price coming from a downtrend. Um, so, oh, is the question is, so for example, you know, if a stock is going higher and it's now coming down, how do you, how do you trade that? Um, you would buy a put option here. So for example, if let's say, Here's an example, Electrolux. Electrolux, you know, as you can see, strong stock started to come down here. Um, I don't know that it's turned around here just yet. So I don't think Electrolux is maybe the best example here. Let's see if I can find another one here. Let's do this. Here's a stock that may be, you know, strong uh, move here to the upside, has moved sideways here and maybe started to come down here. Maybe that's a good example here. Um, let's see, February puts, hmm, not sure why the premiums of these are screwed up. Let's take a look. Um, okay, here's an example. Here's a stock that was bullish, recently gapped lower, and maybe you think is now going to continue moving lower. Um, so you would buy a put option. Uh, you know, if that's, if I, I, I'm guessing that's what your question is. How do you trade this? Um, you would buy a put option. You can go maybe out to February, buy a put option, and that put option will profit if the stock was to move lower. The more the stock moves lower, the more profits you will receive for that put option. 
But the challenge with the put option is that if the stock doesn't move any lower, you also still lose money. And when the stock goes higher, you have to find risk. Um, and the, the reason that I suggest buying a put option is that if you're wrong and the stock goes higher, you're only risking what you've paid. You can't risk more than what you've paid when you buy a put option. That is generally speaking, the first, you know, if you're learning about how to trade bearish opportunities, uh, this would be where you would start. Now I have a course here. Um, if you look at the link that I just sent you, um, we do have a course on, let's see, I'm gonna give you the best course to use. Uh, on, on December 5th of 2019, I hosted a webinar called Options 101, Trading Bullish and Bearish Markets. So in the link that I just sent you in the chat window, the, the Options 101 on December 5th, uh, 2019, that should be the, the webinar that you watch that will show you, you know, what a put option is and how to use the options play tool to analyze put options for your trading. Um, Karen, so, you know, we've been doing digital events like this all year. Um, I think we did uh, over 20 events here this year alone. So I'm really looking forward to doing a, a lot more also or, or more in 2021. Uh, this is actually the last one that we're doing for the year of 2020. So um, this is the last one for this year. I, I hope that, you know, everyone has a safe and happy holidays, but I will be seeing you guys in 2021. Um, any last questions before I sign off here for today? Well, I, thank you everyone that wished me well. Thank you so much. I hope that you guys found, you know, all the education that we provided here in the year of 2020 useful for you. And if you missed any of them, like I said, the link that I just sent you in the chat window, which I will send one more time before I sign off, has access to all of the videos that we have recorded here. All of the events that we have recorded since we started back here in 2019 are available to you. I, I would encourage you, especially over the holidays, if you have a little bit of time to review some of that information so that you can start next year with a solid understanding of options trading for your portfolio. And then when we come back in 2021 and we start to teach you more, you already have that solid foundation, especially for those of you that are relatively new. So with that, thank you so much for your, for your time and, and, and um, uh, opportunity to teach you guys here in the year of 2020. Again, I wish everyone a safe and happy holidays and looking forward to coming back and doing more of these in next year. So thank you so much. Happy holidays. Happy Merry Christmas. Safe New Year's. Um, have a great year and I'll see you guys here uh, in 2021. Thank you so much. Have a great day.